On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Alonzo Benavides. He is the SVP of engineering at The Block. We're going to be talking about a few things within the hiring challenges within the blockchain space. Alonzo comes to us with great background within fintech in general. He's been at Block for a little bit. And he's going to give us a little bit of background on who he is. But really, the episode will be centered around talking about some of the, maybe the stigmas getting into blockchain, some of the attributes you need in excelling within the space. Alonzo, thanks for being on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all the listeners. I definitely appreciate uh, that I can join you. Absolutely. So I guess uh, two things. You know, I kind of mentioned a little bit about your background, but we'd love to know who the block is, if you could tell us that. And then also, what are your responsibilities as the SVP of engineering there? Yeah. So at, at a high level, the block is an information services company that helps institutions who invest in or work with digital assets in crypto to make smart decisions using our news, data, and research. So we're really trying to empower you know, the decision makers you know, with probably the highest quality content that they can find. And that's the very interesting space. You know, I've been in blockchain since about 2012. So I guess just to get into a little bit of my, my history here, you know, going back to my school days, I was really just a glorified problem solver. I love computer science, physics. I interned at NASA a few years. I thought I would be going to Mars and solving those problems. But luckily, I was hit in the head with a football at a career fair by a startup. And they were called the Applied Predictive Technologies Company. And that's the company that I actually built my roots as a software engineer. That's the company that ultimately got acquired by MasterCard for $600 million. And then you know, I got to see the growth of you know, the 90-person business that I joined all the way up through the 2,500-person data and services org in MasterCard. So for me, having done that path and also having been in blockchain you know, for a little while, at least reading white papers and understanding the technology, it seemed like a perfect time to kind of get into the space, especially in a world where information wasn't all equal. Things that I were reading were not always factual. It was really hard to find high-quality information in blockchain. Whereas in data and services, I was surrounded by high quality data and a lot of the problems we were solving were kind of on the tail end. So here I saw myself with plenty of the knowledge of blockchain and fintech and lots of opportunity in this kind of informational space to bring that high quality kind of data to the conversation. So I'm super excited to have made that pivot from MasterCard to a block over a little bit of a year ago. And now I'm really focusing on making sure the business can capitalize on this market opportunity. Awesome. I guess if you were to listen to uh, crypto Twitter, you'd uh, know that you're already kind of heading to the moon based on everyone's hopes of uh, what's going to happen to their coins. But nonetheless, I guess, you know, just to kind of jump into the episode, and I think it'd be kind of interesting to kind of start off because obviously we're going to talk about some of the hiring challenges within the space. And then we can kind of talk about a little bit of your experience as well. But you left a, you know, a company that I kind of acquired via MasterCard. You obviously were at MasterCard for a little while, left to join an actual startup, smaller company within the space. And I know, I guess you, you really wanted to, you're kind of curious about that move, but what were some of the drivers obviously leaving the comforts of the larger company, going to something you know, that's you know, much smaller? I would say one of the primary drivers was actually um, the CEO, Mike McCaffrey. Uh, I had a conversation with him, I guess, you know, last January. And you know, he told me about what he was building at the block and, and what kind of challenges they were running into. And it was kind of funny because the first phone call, you know, he definitely was not trying to recruit me by any means. He was just you know, another graduate from Carnegie Mellon that was seeking the advice of somebody else. And we kind of just talked about his business and what I knew. And we kind of got to that moment where I was like, I didn't know you're the CEO of an information services company in blockchain. He says, well, I didn't know that you knew a bunch about blockchain and had been in fintech for a decade. Maybe we should work together. And that's kind of what really kickstarted the conversations. And as I tried to give him advice on you know, what they were running into, I kind of realized that I actually had quite a lot of the skill set that they were looking for. And they had a position out for a, a VP of engineering. And you know, I said, hey, you know, that sounds interesting that you kind of have that need. And I think I have a lot to offer. So, you know, let's talk. And that's kind of how things got started. I would say the other driver that's memorable, you know, is really just, <laughs> frankly, the pandemic, if I'm being honest. You know, being in the pandemic changed a lot of work norms. You know, I was used to going 
you know, into the office a certain amount of the time. I was used to certain, you know, types of meetings. And then, you know, in order to preserve all the talent at MasterCard, there was a lot of changes to how they were kind of supporting remote first. And a lot of that, you know, didn't really put me in a position of speed. And I definitely like to develop, you know, quickly. And I like to build engineering teams. I'm passionate about engineering management. Also innovation and bringing, you know, new tools to the conversation. So I had enough tools that were, you know, stuck in awaiting compliance review that I figured my pace was slowing down. Whereas in blockchain, you know, everything is, is fast and rapid, right? You can fork entire blockchains and start, you know, just at the position that they were ending. So the speed of innovation in this sector is, is unparalleled, in my opinion. So knowing that and feeling the speed that I was going really incentivized me to take it more seriously. It's interesting. And I guess I know you guys are more involved in the information services side, not necessarily building physical product. But obviously, it's the company you work for is called The Block. When you know, friends and family were hearing about the move and you know, they hear the name, were there some eyebrows or, oh, you're joining a blockchain company or you're going to crypto or, you know, probably prefer to <laughs> any other terms that you could probably throw in there. But was there any questions or kind of, hey, are you sure? Or, or was it more like, hey, you know, we see this <laughs> emerging area, go jump in there, which I, I don't know if you definitely get from, you know, maybe older uh, friends or family. Yeah, I think um, it was definitely different. I think age was definitely a factor. You know, I think I remember my mom's was the you know first memory here. And she said, I have no idea, you know, what you're talking about, but I completely trust that you're making the right moves. Please continue to take vitamins and work out and like take care of yourself. Like that was basically the biggest, um, you know, flag that was thrown my way. But in terms of everybody else, I kind of got a very, I don't know, supportive answer. You know, a lot of people just said, it's about time. (laughs) I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that you could be in the space. And that you could do quite well in this space. So, like, you know, it was only a matter of time before you left MasterCard. And even within MasterCard, I was a StartPath ambassador. So, I was looking at startups and I was trying to help them kind of build their portfolio. So, even within MasterCard, I was constantly pushing the edges of what was possible. And, you know, I found it really warm welcome when my friends kind of noticed that I was going to blockchain. They said, go get it. We know what you're after and it makes a lot of sense. You know, when you're a big shot later, you know, make sure you give me a call and tell me, you know, what to invest in. It was kind of the only hook at the end. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's asking you to tell them what to buy. I guess what's interesting with that is, yeah, you know, obviously your your mom's, you know, with you of uh, making sure you take values. I like that. That's great. Probably that's similar for my mom. I guess the reason I was asking you that there is a bit of a, I guess, unknown factor to people, right? People take the view of, you know, the space. It's what I've seen is it's very polar opposite views. Either people love it or people just don't want to approach it. And some of it's just not understanding the difference between maybe what people hear about crypto being traded versus the actual core technology. And I guess when you're kind of looking at the market, obviously you guys dealing with more of the information services side, do you see that stigma at all when you're trying to hire? Just obviously, again, I know you guys aren't a product company, but does that factor in at all? Yeah. I mean, first, I think I would push back on, you know, we're not a product company. I think if I do my job well, we will be seen as a product company and certainly a, a SaaS company at the end of the day. So check back in with me uh, end of this year. And I think we can see you know, how I've done on the inflection point. But I do think to get to the, the answer, there is a stigma, I think, when it comes to blockchain, right? For a lot of people, it's just that it's volatile. Meaning that how can you support these jobs if there's a downturn? That's kind of the classic question. And this is actually one of the reasons why I like the block is because of the customers. We're pulling some customers from the Fortune 500. We're pulling customers from the crypto space that are some of the largest you know, names in the industry. And these are companies that aren't going to go bankrupt at any point. So they're going to be able to keep paying our you know, prices. And you know, I think that that is very invigorating for me as someone who's joining the startup with the intent to accelerate growth and create more growth. I'm already seeing the growth already there. And I'm seeing it from the segment of customers that have a lot of money and have a lot of staying power. So for me, you know, I know I may be a little bit more of a, you know, they call me a a believer, right? I believe in blockchain. It will be here in decades to come, mainly because I believe in the technology and how resilient it is. You know, I think of how I could attack a blockchain and how I could bring Bitcoin down 
And the reality is it's quite difficult. And that is invigorating to me as a product, right? At least as a product that we can all use, right? It's this distributed ledger technology and ultimately a you know a store of value. So, you know, people might be asking, like, well, how are you going to make money in, in a blockchain information space? And I think it's, you know, for those paying attention, there's a lot of ways to make money, right? High quality information is critical, right? If you're making a, a large deal or if you're, you know, at a key decision point, paying a little bit more money to have an extra 10% of a surety that it's going to work out for you, you're probably willing to pay that. So being in the high quality information space to me, isn't very risky. If it wasn't the block, if I was at another area or another company that didn't have the reputation and the research team that the block has, I think I would be more concerned. But it's really, to me, if I'm being really blunt, you know, I think it's one of the, the safer areas of blockchain in terms of the types of companies that can run. You know, It's not a single token that dictates the success of our business, but instead the software that we build, the content that we create, and the connections that we build in the industry. And with our headquarters in New York, I think they've solved the part that I don't want to solve, which is the relationships and, and the, the connection with the you know, uh, market movers. And so I just have to come in and build world-class software. And that's something that, that I think I can do. Yeah. Just to, just to clarify, what I, uh, I do believe that you guys are you know, building a product. Uh, obviously, we could draw some analogies to similar businesses, but obviously you guys are doing it for the blockchain crypto space. I was probably referring to more of a you know, actually trying to build a you know a token that you're going to release to the general public or whatnot. So maybe slight nuance that I was trying to imply there, but no, I think I think it's interesting because what you just mentioned, you know, providing information that somebody would be willing to pay a little bit more for to be able to make a better decision. I guess just a side question outside of maybe what the topic was going to be when you're looking at that business and you're looking at a lot of the information that is available. And you're seeing the general public and you know a regular person trying to make heads or tails of this. I guess is the company focused more on those institutional larger companies, or is it kind of trying to help? I guess provide information to maybe those individual buyers who are trying to make their first dabble or purchases in in the crypto space. So you know, I, I would say, I mean, number one, we're a company that wants to look at both B two B and B two C kind of across the board. Right. So we're very interested in having a perspective, you know, for the general public to kind of take into account and learn. However, you know, I do think that our advantage or, or where we have a competitive edge is actually in the higher stakes, you know, B2B environments where, you know, they have maybe, you know, 50 different consultants that may need this type of knowledge base and may need, you know, access to our teams in order to really be successful in the market, right? So that to me is a lot more of an opportunity than I think the broader education of kind of someone new to crypto. So I don't think we're super friendly at the end of the day for the new person in crypto. With that said, you know, I think I, I can already feel, you know, this my CEO kind of saying, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> we have a free newsletter that we put, you know, every day, seven days a week out to our our users. And that is, I think, unparalleled in the space. You know, we're putting out constant content that's original content and it's put into those newsletters. So, you know, while I can say that I want to focus on, on, you know, B2B, you know, SaaS, you know, I think there's a whole other part of the business that's constantly thinking about the newsletter approach, you know, our free newsletter and how we, you know, build the subscription base there. So I don't know. I think that's one of the things that excites me about this company is that there's not just one, you know, horse in the race here. We're actually considering a product suite that covers quite a lot of different segments and audiences. And it definitely puts us in a, in a strong position going forward, I think. Yeah, so yeah, I've been on the site. I mean, there's a lot of information there. Yeah, so I was kind of curious you know, who the target was, but I could definitely see kind of the, uh, the B2B component as well. Let me just build on that real quick because you know, I think part of the difficulty we have is actually getting the right content to the right person. There is so much content that we have and a lot of it is incredibly dense. So if you don't know what you're searching for, or if you don't know the specific category you should be listening to, it can be overwhelming. And, and I think that's, I don't know, I think that's kind of par for the course. You know, I kind of smile every time someone brings up kind of the new person in crypto space because I don't think anyone has an easy landing in the crypto space. I think we're talking about one of the most volatile, innovative, disruptive, you know, things on the planet right now. 
We're changing distribution models, building models, how people connect, how teams are formed, funding models. So I don't expect somebody to say, hey, I want to invest in crypto and for them to actually start to understand all of the macro and micro level kind of things that are happening in the market and on the blockchain level. Still, the market is very heavily focused on some of the larger L1s, but there's a lot of great innovation happening kind of across the entire blockchain space that to me is very exciting. And it means that we have almost you know, an endless set of topics to dig deep on. It just means that we need to find that right person who actually needs to understand the difference between you know, uh, technology X and technology Y for use cases A, B, and C and geographies D, right? Yeah, no, 100%. That's a great view. And I think you're right about that. And I mean, yeah, it's definitely a cool product that you guys do have. Kind of to jump back to the maybe the topic, I know uh, we could probably talk about some of the uh, informational side of the company for a while. But I guess when you're looking at hiring, and I mean, I'm sure you're, it sounds like you're growing your team, you're trying to uh, build out more capabilities. When you're looking at people, and I guess when, if you're looking at people who are supposed to, you know, looking to join, is there certain attributes that you think for your team people would excel? And I guess I know, again, you guys aren't, you know, building an actual, you know, crypto coin that'll be out there. And I think that might be a question I was going to ask you if, you know, when somebody's looking at the block, do you have to deal with that? You know, what will I be doing? It's information services. Is it people that are really interested in crypto that should be joining? Is it people that are just good engineers? Do you like a mix? What would benefit your team out of curiosity? So I think that's a great question. And it's actually a question that I've changed my answer to since joining. So when I first started, I was convinced that we did not need a bunch of crypto experts, that from a technical perspective, we were building a lot of web technology. And I thought that we didn't need to basically pay a lot of the premiums out there for a blockchain engineer if we weren't going to be writing smart contracts or something super specific, right? And also, I have a fair amount of crypto knowledge. So I figured, hey, I can support the growing department. And that's kind of where I think my ego got ahead of me. And that was the wrong call to make. It was probably more of a balanced approach that I needed to take at the onset. But today, we are really looking for folks who are very interested in crypto. And even when we were looking for folks with a skill set in the website, we were still looking for them to have interest in crypto. We just didn't require that they were actually kind of experts in crypto or, or had been in crypto for enough years to know the differences of the various blockchains or to understand how liquidity pairs work or how trading pairs on an exchange or how a DEX versus centralized exchange might work. Right? These are things that we figured people could learn. But the pace that we're going and the speed at which we need to develop products and in kind of iterate with customer feedback doesn't really budget a lot of time for folks to get spun up. You know, I think of engineers at Bloomberg that take six months to get ready to go and they'll go work on a project and they'll have all this mentors and they get six months to incubate. We don't have that luxury. And you know, we're a startup at the end of the day. So I do think for folks who are wondering if they should be working at the block, you know, I definitely think they need to be very excited about crypto. If they don't know a lot about it, they need to be learning about it already and probably wanting to learn even faster. And we're looking for folks who are, you know, frankly, you know, very curious about technology and innovation and they're wanting to learn. They're asking really good questions about the space and the tech and our products and our users. So we want curious people, right? We want humble people who, you know, will actually be willing to jump in and roll up their sleeves. You know, I remember my first day on the job, I asked, who's the quality assurance engineer? And they all looked at me and they were like, well, there's seven of us and none of us are that. And I was like, okay, we'll all be the QA for the foreseeable future. And you could see the blank faces in the meeting room. And they're like, well, why would you, what do you mean? Like, don't we need to go hire for that? I was like, we don't have time to hire for everything. Like, yes, we will hire and put out roles, but we need to be able to wear multiple hats. So it doesn't matter what my title is. If what you're saying is that we need a quality view on you know, this feature before it goes out, I'm more than willing. And so is the CEO for that matter. So we need to be really humble in what we do for the company. And then I guess the other two things that come to mind are, are about like, Tenacious ownership. So making sure that what you're working on, you're driving to completion, right? That you have high throughput throughout that process, that you're you know, acting as an owner of the overall problem just as much as the specific ask, right? We want to make sure that everyone's communicating. And if you don't have people expressing good ownership, then things are going to fall through the cracks. 
right? So we need people who are going to actually kind of run through um, the problem itself. And then the last part is, I think, respectful partnership. So making sure that as we go fast, we continue to you know take into account you know collaboration in a remote first environment. So how are you you know partnering with sales? How are you partnering with the research team or the editorial team? And how are you getting all of these different viewpoints to make the best answers for our customers? So those are all the top five things that, that I guess come to mind when I'm trying to figure out who I'm looking for, just aside from kind of the key skills that would come with a specific title or role. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, I guess the need to have somebody who has that interest, maybe a baseline of what you guys are actually building out. I mean, it makes sense why you need that. And I guess, you know, lots of companies within the crypto space hire across all kinds of geography, time zones, anywhere globally. Are you guys mainly, you said remote first, how's the team set up within that remote component? So I would say it varies by department. So specifically in, in product and engineering, we have the majority of our folks in the US or US aligned time zone. So some folks in Canada. And we also have a team member in Croatia who we've been working with and we've brought on full time. So we have mostly a US-based strategy. But over the last few months, I think we've been starting to consider kind of more and more additional geographies. I know we're, we're looking in Europe at a minimum for some overlap in making sure that we can support our global editorial and global research teams. I think they are in a way kind of more distributed than we are because, you know, I've been a remote manager well before COVID. You know, when I moved to San Francisco and continued to lead engineering teams, I was one of the only remote managers and I had to figure it out. Right. And you learn a lot of things that, you know, you have to change in your day to day approach. And for me, communication ends up being the biggest factor for any team that's trying to scale and go fast. So if people don't know how to communicate with each other and they're not, you know, getting to the right answers quickly, it's going to really drag, I think, the whole effort down. Right. So I was convinced that the closer we are in time zone, the easier it would be, the more overlap we would have in a day, the farther we would go on any given day. And this just comes from my experience working with teams all over the world, where in some cases, you know, you have to be very prescriptive, especially if there's a language barrier. You actually have to really detail out exactly what you want done, by what time, exactly what the test is that it solves. But then you end up with a solution that maybe isn't as robust, right? Maybe it literally only works for the cases you wrote down, right? And I don't have time to actually perfectly scope everything. There's a lot of needs of a growing business. So I need more people who can actually lead an effort and drive it to completion, not 50 people who are going to ask me, what is the first and the second and the third and the fourth task to do today? I need people who are going to self-solve that for themselves. So, you know, we've definitely had a challenge, I think, growing the team, kind of thinking from the bottom up and the top down, making sure we have the right leadership, but also making sure we have the right you know, uh, more junior engineers who want to build a career in blockchain and who are you know willing to do whatever it takes to kind of get there. So it's definitely been a evolving strategy over time as we think about what products we want to build and where that expertise is, frankly, on the planet. So I will say that we're becoming even more friendly as time goes on. But I do have a need now for, I think, even stronger, more senior engineers to make sure that we can kind of realize our goals this year. Interesting. I guess as you're looking at hiring more people in Europe, I guess, how would you adjust your management structure to account for maybe people who are... You know, I know you have one person in Croatia, but other people sitting in other countries. I think the management structure now lends itself pretty well to that expansion and that growth. At the end of the day, I really believe in autonomous teams. Right? Teams need a dedicated mission. They need cross-functional people. They need everyone to be bought into the same kind of goal at the end of the day. So if I can iron out a lot of those things and make sure that they have the right leader, I think a lot of this stuff will self-solve. We practice, you know, agile development at the block. So, you know, there are meetings every day that we have stand up to discuss the latest blockers and make sure that people are kind of getting unblocked at a timely capacity. And that's really my window into each team. So I can pop in on any team at a specific time and actually talk to everybody. So my calendar is usually quite crazy. You know, I like to say that folks should 
you know, be really good at managing their work-life balance. Just don't copy me <laughs> because, you know, my schedule will change based off of those that need me. And at the end of the day, if I need to be up at 4am to help someone in Europe with something, like I would rather be there than not be there or have the meeting not happen. So it does mean that I have to be a contortionist when it comes to my calendar. But I think it's a, a small price to pay for getting people on the same page and not losing those days. Because I don't know if you've worked with teams kind of you know across different continents, but you end up there's like a lost day factor where I say, hey, you know, Amir, can you solve X for me? And then at the end of your workday, you say, you know what? If Alonzo would tell me the answer to this question, then I could solve that. So now you have to wait for me to come back to answer that question. And then you just start over the next day. So we lost the whole day because you had one question. And that's really, I think, my biggest fear or concern is that pace that gets set in that kind of distributed type of environment. But that can be solved by slacking me quickly. And I will try to get people unblocked fast, but I need people to throw things at me so that I can hit them. Stop all analogy there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that that's the, I guess, the biggest constraint probably in, in having someone sit multiple time zones away is that overlap of, oh, I need this question. Everything holds until you can respond uh, whenever you can via Slack. I guess when you're looking at hiring, I guess I was going to say, you know, we, we just talked about the you know, managing times. And when you're looking at a hiring, do you anticipate adjusting your hiring process to factor for somebody seeing a different country? Will the standard... I mean, obviously, you want certain standard coding, but will the process change? Because obviously, different people have different experiences, different experiences in a hiring interview cycle versus maybe the way it's done here in the States. So I guess there's two things. So there's the hiring process, which I would like to be the same for everyone who joins my department. But before I get deeper on what is our hiring process... I do want to kind of acknowledge that you know, process is a big part of staying on top of things. So one of the first things I did, I think it was actually my first week at the company, was I installed Jira and Confluence. So Jira is a task tracking solution that engineers love. And Confluence is a knowledge management you know, uh, repository, right? Some people will refer to it as a wiki. I see it as a little bit more than that. I see it as a tool for collaborating and also keeping things up to date in terms of the group think on something, right? So I actually have my notifications set up so that whenever anyone creates a document, creates a tech design, answers a question in a comment, I actually see all of that. And I try my best to keep up with all of it. So that is the one process change that I did kind of institute very quickly was, you know, for me to be able to balance these spinning plates, I need everyone to use the same task tracker. And I need everyone to agree that we will try hard to put our knowledge into this confluence tool. And that way we can keep evolving, you know, what we're thinking without it living on a post-it note or in a Jira ticket or in a pull request comment. So that was a big change and shift for us. But I think if they can buy into that process, I can keep up with them. So I just wanted to make sure that that was kind of noted as well, that you can't just do your job the normal way. If you're going to kind of really be hitting high efficiency, there needs to be some organization to that knowledge flow. Right. And for me, that's kind of the place that we settled. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think the key to, I think, a couple of the points you've made around hiring is actually that information sharing. So I think that that's probably, especially if you're starting to move time zones away, that information lag is, is of paramount importance to make sure that everyone has access and visibility. So I think it makes a lot of sense and, and standardizing as much as you can, regardless of where people are 100%. I mean, that's got to be. The only way you can scale anything. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to jump into the hiring question there? Yeah. I was going to circle back and just say if you could just touch on that, because I think that was the other part of uh, the question that could be interesting to listen to. So, to me, recruiting is, is very important. You know, my first interaction with recruiting was actually getting hit in the head with a football from a, someone at a career fair. But those people were what we called school managers. They were in charge of specific schools and they actually you know, built relationships with the people at those schools and all the clubs and they knew which you know, clubs and classes to market to, right? So it wasn't a, too long before I became kind of the Carnegie Mellon school manager and I had to build a recruiting pipeline and manage those relationships. And I remember how much effort I had to put into that. And it was a full company process. Everybody participated in recruiting. There was no one you know, above recruiting. So, you know, 
another thing you know that happened in the first week was that we started recruiting standups and i put the entire you know p e group together and said hey we're going to uncomfortably talk about recruiting you know, every day until we feel that we can back off this cadence and we're making progress so when i asked hey what's the recruiting process they said oh well you know we we interview them so okay well that's great we should interview them but how do we actually separate ourselves from the other recruiting processes right so sure there's a initial tech screen you know first round phone screen where you're just making sure that they understand the role you're making sure that there's no red flags you know should we proceed right that's first round and then second round goes to more technical you know can you actually solve a technical problem that would lead us to believe that we can work with you some roles would be using you know a uh, github and actually having a coding exam there and expecting a pull request others would be using you know a quiz type software to ask certain questions so everyone had a different approach but the point was we needed to see them in a technical capacity and then there was the last part what i would call the final round interview and this is you know was new for everybody but i championed a tool called gather.town so if you don't know gather.town it's a fun little startup that created like a virtual office space and it really got popular right around when the pandemic happened and this is where i created the final round process so the first 15 minutes were a meet and greet with the team and there was you know a panel of people and we would have back and forth questions basically testing fit and knowledge and comfort of communication and all sorts of things they were just in kind of a group setting where everyone in the department could participate right that was the first maybe 15 or 30 minutes and then that rolled into an hour problem solving session so a smaller group go to a different room in the virtual office and you know start your interview there and you know we will talk about the code that you wrote or we'll test things live but it's meant to be a very hands-on collaborative technical discussion right and then following that would be the C round kind of C suite interview we called it um so if they were a software engineer they would meet with me if they were of other roles they might we might have a different leader from the management committee kind of step in and do those interviews but we wanted to make sure that leadership stayed aware of everyone who was coming in and kind of approved of, of all of those people so um yeah i was very serious when i said that it takes the whole company to build a good recruiting engine so that was our approach basically that final round gauntlet we called it in this virtual environment and you could always see people kind of show up to my interview at the end of the day you know smiling and like overwhelmed at the same time they're like i've never been in, in an interview like this i said that's great that means we're doing something right right we're here to innovate we're in the most innovative space so i'm not here to pop in on zoom for 15 minutes and like ask you some scripted questions i'm going to ask you questions that you know may make you uncomfortable but i'm going to see how you respond and how you you know act under stress and how you solve with technical rigor and you know i think that what we've built is a very good process and it's one that has continued to kind of evolve over time as our people operations function kind of got off the ground because there were no recruiters when I joined. It was all homegrown and now we actually have, you know, three people in our people ops team that are helping with recruiting and getting everybody, you know, in the pipeline for us. So now the gather town is just used for the final round, but we hold on to that kind of in our experience for everyone in PNE and even in interviews that I do for other roles. I'll try to bring them into the gather town office so that I can see if they can make it past reception. It's an interesting process. I guess just to kind of out of curiosity, when you were kind of putting this process together, how much internal education did it take to obviously kind of, you know, you mentioned obviously you had to get recruiting correct, but how much of that was internal education to kind of, you know, go through Gather Town, understand the reasons why you set up the process the way you're hoping to? Honestly, internal like education and technical education is critical to any scaling company so i hope everyone is constantly thinking about how they can learn and grow and upskill right but i don't think i really had that issue with the group that we work with here at the block and that's honestly gave me a lot of confidence because i was expecting pushback you know coming from you know not to throw you know mastercard under the bus or any big corporation but you get used to friction and you get used to people saying should we do that why are we doing that give me 15 reasons to do this and what about can we do it next year instead of this year and you know there's a hundred reasons that you shouldn't do this idea is kind of the perspective sometimes where in the startup world we don't have time to do all of that due diligence mm -hmm. and if 
you did ask that many questions, you might be seen as kind of slowing things down. So just like when I instituted Jira and Confluence, I think it was three days before the entire department adopted it and moved all of their documents into the system. We got rid of our Trello boards. We got rid of our post-it note systems. Two, three days to completely adopt two brand new systems. And that's fast. That is very fast. And no one really, I'd say, pushed it to an area where, hey, I don't know, Alonzo, like, this might be too much work. This might be this. Instead, it was, when do you need us to do this? Let's go do that. Let's get it done. And same with Gather Town, where I gave them the basics. I brought them to the town. I said, look at this, interact with it. You know, people were throwing palm trees into rooms and you know, people were messing with the customization features. And then by the time I said, hey, like, I want to use this in our you know, final round recruiting effort, there was no pushback. And basically, everybody said, that makes a ton of sense. Let's do it. Should we do our standups here as well? Sure. Let's do that as well. So now we actually have you know, quite a few events and even a, our p e virtual happy hours happen in Gather Town. I think we just maxed out the number of seats in the main conference room, which is a big milestone for me, actually, as small as it may sound. <laughs> no, that's, that's super cool. I mean, the fact that also the stakeholders of the company embrace the new, you know, obviously you guys, like you mentioned, are in an innovative space. So, you know, run with it. Let's see if it works. You know, we can always adjust later mentalities. Pretty awesome. Flip question to the one I asked was, can you first see, I guess, as you guys are adding more process that you're going to have to go back and re-architect some of what has worked to this point? Because obviously getting to, you know, certain headcount, the process is there. You know, obviously, congrats, you maxed up the seat allocation, which is kind of cool in Gather Town. But to go above that, are you going to go back and revisit? Do you revisit the process, or what the frequency would be? Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely you revisit the process. I've already seen it happen in some recent hires. They hired someone in particular who, you know, can go quite fast and, and has built, you know, startups before. And the first thing they threw out the window was basically the two week sprint. And at first, you know, I could have had a, a pretty panicked reaction of saying, hey, 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 like everyone's doing the two week sprint. Like it's all on my calendar already. Like please don't mess with this. But, you know, instead, this person took everything down to the bare bolts and said, what? is going on? What is the most important thing to get done? What are the business goals? You know, We should be solving this, this, and this. Let's do this by end of day. Let's do this by end of tomorrow. And they went, rather than from the two-week perspective, down to the daily planning. So they went all the way back to, in Slack, I'm going to give you these bullets. And these are the bullets that we do today. And forget the 15, 20-minute stand-up. Let's do that in four minutes. So this person kind of shook all the things and help the team really grasp kind of where they needed to be. And this was also a group that went from one person to six people in the last two months. So there was a lot more firepower. There was a lot more opinions in the room. And yet everybody really focused. And the team actually produced a, a POC for a product that I can't even talk about. Short order. And, and they got it out last week. And I was so impressed that they were able to push out a proof of concept with a team that was not even onboarded, but because they were so focused on the short term, it really helped them kind of get confidence and build, frankly, the backlog of work. So now they've gone forward to weekly planning. So now at the end of the week, we're kind of conversing and making sure that the goals are aligned. So even though I might not have had a lot of visibility in the beginning, you know, we're getting to that point now where, you know, maybe we'll be getting to weekly or, you know, two week sprints. So I definitely think that. You know, we have to keep adapting. That is the agile way. So if there's feedback that's important, you need to adapt with it and you need to actually make a change. So if I'm hearing that people are feel like they're going slow and they could go faster, forget this overhead. I'm not going to get rid of it for everyone in the department, but for your group, I believe in autonomous teams. And I've said that before and I'll say it again. Autonomous teams can make these choices, right? I just need to check in and monitor and, and make sure that the culture is ultimately going in the right direction. So yeah, absolutely, we should be challenging process, especially when the stakes are high and we need to deliver on certain milestones, right? Or deadlines. I think that's when you know people really get honest with their feedback. Uh, hey, I can't do X or Y because this is in front of me. All right, well, what if I remove that? Can you do it then? Yeah, I can. Oh, well then consider it gone. And that's the pace that we're going right now. And I think it depends on the team you're on. But um, I will expect kind of different levels of maturity on the planning side as long as we're in product exploration mode. Interesting. 
what's the reaction if you as you're interviewing people to hire and you someone asks, hey, you know, what's the methodology look like? You know, you guys run a standard two week sprint, and you're like, nah, we threw that out. <laughs> I guess as as you're onboarding people, people going through the interview process, how do they take the fact that you know, I guess you went to daily and then obviously now weekly planning. I think people have taken it really well. You know, ultimately people know they're joining a startup and they know they're joining a startup in the blockchain space. So, you know, we have to keep that pulse on the customer and we have to keep adapting to kind of what the market is doing. So I, I think people are prepared for new ways of doing things. I haven't seen any kind of negative, I think, reaction to that stuff. I actually was just checking in with a lot of those team members last week saying, Hey, you know, I just wanted to check in and, and, you know, see how, you know, your efforts going and if you're enjoying it, right? What is the environment like? What is your mood? And it was funny to see the reaction because at first, you know, to play devil's advocate, I was already thinking like, Oh no, like someone's going to feel, you know, pushed or put in an uncomfortable situation. And, you know, it's different than what other teams are doing. So maybe they feel targeted. And that is not what happened. What happened was that people felt energized by the focus and they felt supported and that they were working on one of the highest priority things. So it ended up, I don't know, being a a benefit. And maybe that's just like how human brains kind of respond to adverse situations, right? If you have a difficult thing to deliver, like you can convince yourself maybe that it's the right way to do it. But regardless, the result is clear. The team was energized. They're excited about what they were building. And they were already kind of working on the next close milestone. And multiple people started asking me, how do I get promoted? How do I, how do, I do more? What does the next level look like? Who are we hiring? Can I help with recruiting? And all of a sudden, you start seeing these other questions come out that are just outside of, hey, could I have coded this differently? Yes, we could discuss that. But here, if you're in a startup, you know, we expect people to wear multiple hats and for everyone to be an owner. So seeing everybody respond to that challenge in a productive and proactive way and for that to carry through to the other parts of running a team to me it was actually very inspiring to see that play out because you know it wasn't what i would have done but you know i think you have to trust the people you know that are on your team and this was that case where i trusted them to run and i just checked in at the end of the race and it turned out they ran a pretty fast race i like that I mean, it's, uh, I think you said building autonomous teams. I think the flip side to that is you can only get autonomous teams if you trust them. So it sounds like you're building a really good culture, really, really awesome process. I mean, the gathered town component seems really, you know, innovative to kind of manage the, the whole remote process, throwing out the two week sprints. I think it all sounds like a really good environment to be in. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I appreciate you being on and talking. I know uh, we went over a little bit, but uh, uh, you, you had great insights. I'm, I'm glad we could uh, keep talking. If somebody wants to reach out to you to kind of touch on anything that you brought up on the podcast, what's a good way of getting hold of you? This is going to sound crazy as an answer. I can't believe I'm saying this in you know 2022, but you can DM me in Twitter. There you go. I think that uh, my DMs are open. I've been definitely keeping an eye on the space and on sentiment there. And so it's an easy way. And I only have like 500 followers. So nobody messages me. So if anyone were to message me on Twitter, you would literally be at the top. Like that's higher odds that I respond than if you were to email me. Cause I think I get like 3000 emails, you know, in a week. So, you know, that plus LinkedIn is a lot of noise. So I would say reach out on Twitter and I will definitely love to hear what your question is and happy to give you a candid response. Awesome. We will definitely put in uh, the show notes the uh, link to your Twitter. Hey, Alonzo, thanks for being on, man. That was great. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thank you to everyone who's listened as well. Definitely looking forward to connecting with more people in the space. Absolutely. That's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different guests, different topic. Until then, I always ask for two things. One, if you find the podcast interesting, share it with uh, someone that might, because that's how we've been growing. And secondly, If you want me to uh, speak to a guest about a specific topic, let me know. I'll do my best in finding that person. Until next time, goodbye. 